Here we go. Here we go. Welcome to Women Matters, the regular meeting of wonderful women of all over the world. We are in New York, California, in South Africa, in Vienna, and in Germany, and in Italy. Really international, I would say. And today, we thought to think about what we can do to support others in this moment of difficulty, we would say. And before we start with the normal check-in, I can check in. Uh, I'm, as I said, in Italy, and the situation here is as it is more or less in all Europe, a little bit difficult and controversial. And, you know, the energy is like dark and heavy. And also from the weather, because we have a, a thunderstorm outside. And if I disappear, you know, I have a electrical, how do you say, a blackout. So <laughs> I hope I will be able to stay. And I give over to South Africa, where it is hot and warm and oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're in a bathing suit. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, thank you, ladies. Firstly, apologies for being late. I'm Anneli in Johannesburg, in South Africa. And I, I was really entrenched in a new initiative and I, I saw it was three minutes to, to your time, five, when I realized, oh my goodness, I'm late. Um, so there's lots of activity going on in my world. Um, in our bigger world, there is um, renewed local lockdowns coming up because people believe it's summer and <clears throat> it's holidays, they can, they can just do whatever. So. It's putting a lot more strain in certain areas of the country on hospitals and the likes. And yes, we are here today and thank you. I love looking forward to this, this very meaningful topic. And I pass over to Christine. Thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, there's some good distraction because it's the holidays and although can't do a lot of normal things that I would like to do, but uh, in terms of getting together with friends and cultural things that are fun. But uh, nonetheless, you know, there's always cookies to bake and uh, a tree to trim and presents to buy. So those are good distractions. Um, but we're on a lockdown starting today uh, in California. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not as bad as it first was back in March, but you know, they're telling us for three weeks, things, uh, most things will be closed um, because of the ICU beds and hospital beds. And it's all based on how much availability there is for that. But um, yeah, it's still fairly warm in California. So we don't have to hunker down too much in our homes yet, but we will pro probably shortly. Um, yeah, and I will turn it over to the other Californian, Victoria. Um, yeah, I think Christine has, has described the, um, the outer <laughs> circumstances that we're in. Um, I'm, my only concern is whether or not Beatrice can come home <laughs> for Christmas. We've never had Christmas apart since she was born, so. Um, I'm determined, even if I have to walk to New York to uh, make sure that we have Christmas together. Um, and I'm, I'm just besieged by like a million projects at once. So I'm, I'm kind of in a state of, of high anxiety right now. Um, everything I'm doing is really interesting, but I signed on for way too much. Um, I think the fact that everything is online now, um, and nobody has to travel to go anywhere makes it um, everything seems so easy and accessible. And I was like a ch you know a kid in the candy store, and I I've signed up for. I mean, even today, I just noticed when I woke up this morning, I've got like five different things today, <laughs> some many of which are conflicting in schedule. And in the meantime, um, next week I have a big. Um, Beethoven birthday celebration next Wednesday, which is Beethoven's 250th birthday. 
So I have that to do as well in the midst of all these other things. Um, I mean, it's all exciting, but, but I kind of went berserk in um, taking on too much. And I will pass to um, our little can New York. Can I just ask a question? Is, is the celebration on Wednesday a performance or what is it? No, it can't be. Um, it's a, it's a, I'll send an email out. I, I just, I just drafted sort of my email blast to friends and, um, and family, etc. Um, but Beatrice wants to look at it because she's a PR specialist. <laughs> so I haven't sent oh, it out it's yet. It's your birthday so, coming up. So what? Is it your birthday coming up? No, no, it's Beethoven's 250th birthday next Wednesday, the 16th, December 16th. And yeah, back to you, Christine. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I'll send the email so you'll see what it is. It's, it's sort of my attempt to celebrate, even though I, I can't perform. Um, normally I would, have, I would have performed live all of Beethoven's violin sonatas with my pianist. We've done that twice before in the past. And of course this was the perfect year to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be uh, essentially a, a, like a lecture, but with music and art from Beethoven's time. I'm gonna try to like evoke the world he was in. So with, with um, and talk about people he met and read, from, I'm gonna read from his correspondence. Um, unfortunately, I have to read in translation because it's you know predominantly an American audience. So if any of you sign up for it, forgive the, <laughs> the fact I can't read in German, it would be much more fun. Um, yeah, so that's, so it's kind of, I'm trying to make it like a multidisciplinary, you know, online event. Um, Cause the violin doesn't, I haven't figured out a way to make the violin really sound good yet. And I have colleagues that have excellent equipment and still sounds horrible. So it's a difficult instrument um, to record. So, um, but thanks for asking Christine. Um, and I will pass over to our New Yorker Beatrice, Beatrice. Hello, um, I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm the other half of the Martino family present <laughs> in this call. Um, and this apple, particular apple does not fall far from the tree. Um, I just finished a long period of a lot of different projects that were overlapping. Um, and um, now I'm on the other side of that. I mean, I still have other things that I'm working on now, but it's, it's I'm going into a period of a little bit less intensity, which I'm looking forward to um, getting to refocus on, on, you know, some personal work and, and things like that. But um, yeah, it's starting to become winter here. Um, I was looking through my my photos and it was reminding me on my phone that last year it was actually our, it was snowing at this point. Um, but we haven't reached that point yet. We've, we're hitting the, the, the 40s. Um, so we're getting, we're inching, inching towards the cold, cold time. Um, definitely have to wear more layers when I go outside. Um, and, and everyone did a weather check-in, so <laughs> that I contribute. Um, and, and as for, I, I suspect at some point we will also go into shutdown. We haven't gotten to that point yet, but um, that's, I'm, you know, with the cold weather, I think a lot of people are going to spend time indoors. We just had the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so I don't know what that's going to do in terms of numbers. Um, so I think a lot of people uh, got together in person for that. Um, I am very much hoping to be able to spend the holiday with, with my mother and with my family. Um, but we don't know if that's going to be possible or safe to do. So I've actually been thinking a lot about how I can maybe decorate this space just in case <laughs> um, and bring some Christmas cheer um, into my little apartment. Um, so that's a project for the upcoming week. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll talk, I'll talk more about what I, what I was doing um, when we get into the larger conversation. But um, yeah, I just finished a project with Reimagine. It's an organization that holds space for people around grief and death. And I also just finished a long run of online performances. Uh, last night was the last show. So those are the two big things I was working on recently. Um, I will pass it to Monia. Yeah, luckily I'm married and my husband asked me, don't you have a conference at five? 
because I just fell into a puzzle and I was so insist I wanted to finish that part of it. Anyway, I'm sorry that I was a little late, but I just pushed everything together. Today is the first day of, but well, today is the first day of the end of the lockdown, of the hard lockdown in Vienna and Austria. So the shops have opened, the hairdresser has opened again. Uh, but people are not too eager to shop, we noticed. The weather isn't really great, but it doesn't rain. It has stopped snowing, but it, there is tremendous amount of snow in the west of Austria. You wouldn't believe it. It's just a couple of kilometers and there they have avalanches and it's, it's really heavy snowing there in Calencia and in the Tyrol. Of course, that's the skiing part of Austria. Um, I woke up this morning feeling <laughs> held and warmed by love. And while I was so half, a, again, half asleep, I sent that to all beings on the planet. And I hope you felt it. <laughs> um, because it was just, yeah, it just reminded me of things that have stopped now because of the pandemic. And it was just beautiful. And when I woke up, I decided to send that kind of love to the universe. Never mind. <laughs> so just why comes, why just the planet, the universe. So I do hope the universe is happy and relaxed. And yeah, it's, uh, there's a great uneasiness about how to act in public. Uh, people sort of, well, in Vienna, people usually are grumpy around this time of the year, but now everybody seems a lot more grumpy and the masks and they just uh, try to avoid you as well as they can. So they have started mask testing in three parts of Vienna and people don't want to go. You think it's ridiculous to go there and it's a very very small percentage of positive results most of them are negative and it's cold and you have to drive there and if you stand there and you have to wait there so this is sort of <laughs> and now they decided uh, maybe we'll just offer some gastro uh, benefits to all who come so they can really but all the the restaurants are still closed so this is, it's just, uh, yeah. Anyway, I feel it's planned to see how uh, the vaccinations will uh, to mass vaccinate people. Otherwise I can't understand why they would all these uh, holes and all this, it's, it's ridiculous. But my daughter went, she is a teacher and they had a quite a higher percentage of teachers that are positive. So it's a good thing they did it. Uh, on the other hand, it's just, that's just the moment you can uh, contract it uh, two days later again. So you have to retest and retest and retest. And I, I guess they are getting used to it by now. They have very quick results. And yeah, but my husband and I, we still live in quarantine. We do puzzles and I read a lot and it's fine. I, I'm very, yeah, I feel I'm almost in a Christmas mood. We have all the uh, lightings up, I'll show you. So we have all these decorations and yeah, sort of I feel Christmassy. Thank you. And I can't look at handily. <laughs> It's really strange on this planet, isn't it? It's so hot and it's so cold at the same time. Yeah, so that's me for today. I, I return to Heidi or, or Beatrice or, or who does it? Gertraud. Gertraud. Heidi is fine. <laughs> but you Gertraud, it's your turn. 
to second. Oh, okay. Um, my turtles are ready to sleep <laughs> for the winter and I would love to hi hibernate as well. Um, yeah, they don't eat any more, even if it's um, if the lamps are on and and it's warm. So they're just really ready ready to sleep. Yeah, and it's been a little bit challenging lately. So um, yeah, and I think hibernating would be a good thing <laughs> to, to do that right now. Um, and actually I'm, I'm in quarantine for thousands of months already, like you did, Amonia, because, um, I mean, I'm working from home and my husband is go, going out not too much because he, he's almost, yeah, he's an event photographer. So that, that's not <laughs> what you do right now. But the, the theater is, is, is um, not open, but they are rehearsing. And so he's, he, he has some, something to do there. It's quiet and we have a lot of family calls. So normally we would just talk to one daughter. She would call and just have a chat and so, and now we really have appointments and, uh, so we come together with five and the two grandkids sometimes. Yeah, and it's 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 nice to to just be together. And uh, um, we cannot go to Austria as we normally do after Christmas. So no way. They have lockdown till the tenth of January. Yeah, and uh, so. And normally we would meet after Christmas, the 26th, uh, um, as the whole family. So my siblings with kids and everybody, a call. <laughs> so just not to break completely with the tradition, but to do it completely different. Yeah, so. And maybe I started today, <laughs> I started a healer training. So I felt like doing that. Yeah, that leads over into the topic. So far we have talked a little bit about how we are dealing with this situation. And when you say you are starting a healer training, that is already an, a project for for helping others, no? That was the topic for today. Uh, maybe we start with you again, and you tell us what you think you can you can do with it. I mean, what what would be the the future? I what I'm hearing from us, we are somehow all waiting in some way, no? In some way or other, or there are um, <clears throat> you do our puzzles and uh, you instead of uh, playing the violin, uh, Victoria, you just change it, but it's always waiting for coming back into what we are normally doing. And um, so who knows how long we have to wait. But in the meantime, we do something. And Gertrude, you say you are beginning a healing training. Let's start with you. Um, I think I don't feel myself he uh, waiting. I think um, there will be a mixture from the old normal and a new normal. So there, we will not go back all the way to how it was, but it will not stay exactly now, like under lockdown. Uh, so, so I think to create a new, a new normal, a new way of, yeah, making it work <laughs> because, um, so for me, there is something like I to be of service to somebody else, like somebody sick or so, I cannot project my sorrows, my concerns, my, oh my God, 
onto them. And, and so at the moment, I'm meditating a lot more than before. Um, I'm, I'm really trying, um, yeah, getting my stuff resolved and, and, and try to find a way to, um, to be kind of neutral, not, uh, without hope and without hopelessness. <laughs> so not to say, oh, then it will be over and everything will be fine again, or to say, oh, everything is, is so bad, but really to, to be in this equanimity, equanimity uh, and, and, and care for myself in order to be able to support others. I think that that's a big part for me. And the training is, um, that's a Swiss guy, <laughs> Patrick. Oh, well, and, and just to feel that love. I, so I, I did some work with him and, and then to really feel how he works. And this was like, that opened up this, this space here. And to be of service, I think you have to have an open heart and not be drawn into the drama, but also not recuse completely and shut up. Yeah, so I think it's work on myself first <laughs> and then open up to, to be of service to others. Yeah, and I'm working on an online training. So this screen is <laughs> already here to, to do that. That's for the moment. I can jump in um, because I actually have a slight of a different kind of experience of this. Um, in I uh, produced this festival retreat. I'm not really sure what to label it, um, but it was uh, thinking. You know, here in the United States, Thanksgiving holiday is a time where people uh, tend to be with family or with loved ones and kind of gather together. Um, but it's also has a very violent and complicated history of what the holiday represents. And so there's this Thanksgiving is kind of coexists in this place of, of feeling thankful and being in community and being with loved ones, but also has this undertone of mourning. And then as we all know, all of us have, you know, have lost loved ones in the past that, you know, the holidays in general tend to be really challenging when you've lost someone um, and especially the first year. Um, but in general, it, it's, it's always you know, hard to have that empty seat at the table when you typically are together. And then this year, you know, with the pandemic, it's even worse in some way because people are more isolated and you know, having to be alone maybe when they typically have community around them. And so I, um, there's an organization, uh, they're based in San Francisco, but they have a chapter in New York as well called uh, Reimagine End of Life. Um, and they host, uh, they used to be in person, but host, you know, festivals around death and grief and healing and looking at these topics from a myriad of perspectives, artistic, um, philosophical, religious, uh, practical, you know, how to take care of the paperwork, you know, um, just kind of the whole, the whole range. Um, and when the pandemic started, they started doing events online. Um, and it's a lot of it is community source, like people in the community can host their own events through their platform. Um, and so I've, I've been kind of following them for a long time, because obviously, you know, I went to grad school to study those topics. And that's, you know, that's the space that I want to be in professionally. Um, and so I've gradually over the, since June, I've developed a relationship with their uh, founder and director. Um, we were co-writing something for a while, which never got published. But um, eventually, you know, I kept bringing up that I wanted to do some event producing. And what came out of it was we decided to create an event that would hold space for people during the holidays. And we decided to, and they'd never done something of this scale before, because they've always had isolated events, a part of a big, you know, like a festival that's, but it had a lot of like little things happening. They'd never done 
I wanted to do a retreat style thing that had, you know, where the same community would come together to multiple events and kind of build on each other. Um, so this was kind of the first experiment to that. Um, so the weekend before Thanksgiving, we had a Friday evening event, a Saturday all day, and then the Sunday event. And then on Thanksgiving day, we had an event. And then that weekend as well, there were a couple of uh, isolated shorter events for people to optionally come to. And then we just concluded um, on Saturday, this Saturday. Um, so it spanned three weekends. Um, and we did all kinds of things. We had meditation leaders, movement leaders. We had a panel discussion of some authors who have written about grief, who talked about how they deal with the holidays. Um, we had a lot of breakout conversations um, with, with kind of guiding discussion questions. Um, we had artistic you know, workshops. We had um, a, a night where just a bunch of artists came and shared work um, as an offering to the community. Um, there's a whole range of things. But anyway, to get back to, I know I'm giving a lot of context, but to get back to what Gertrude was saying about, you know, working on yourself before you can help others. Um, I, I seem to find myself often in the place where I'm doing both at the same time. And maybe, you know, I think it depends on the context. If you're working with one individual, I think that can be dangerous. But um, a lot the work that I do is typically for a larger group of people and I'm facilitating a space, but then when I step back and I'm letting that space exist, sometimes I can also step in and be a part of it. And so at all of these events, I had this strange back and forth of being the presenter and host and MC and having to run all the technology and do all the stuff. And then, you know, there were breakout rooms and sometimes I had somebody else running the tech so I could go into a breakout room and I could talk to two other people and and actually make space for my own grief, because it was all about making space for grief and loss, you know, in, in the midst of the holidays and finding gratitude and joy in the midst of pain. Um, and it was, yeah, it was very intense and emotional for me too. The times that I allowed myself to let my guard down and to kind of take off my presenter hat and just be a person in the space and, and inhabit the space that I had created for others. Um, it was it was really powerful and beautiful. And I and I found myself sometimes feeling kind of jealous of the participants. Because they thought, oh, you know, I just want to attend. I just want to be here and listen to these people. I don't want to be worrying about who do I have to introduce next? And did that person join the Zoom call yet? And, you know, did I pause the recording when the, you know, private information was being shared, but then started again when the public, you know, like all those things that were running around in my head in the background. Um, but, but yeah, I had some beautiful moments thinking about my father and thinking about my grandmother. Those were the two losses that I spent some time on um, over these weekends. But um, I've said a lot. I'm going to stop talking for the moment. But, <laughs> but that's what I recently worked on and how, you know, I've inhabited both spaces. The um, I with with what uh, Gertrude was sharing, it reminded me of something that um, I keep uh, thinking about. A sort of a metaphor that uh, for me is 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 an ongoing learning experience. That um, when Beatrice was first born, we I think well we traveled con continuously. Every week we were on a plane to somewhere um, because. My husband was a, a prominent museum director and um, scholar, and I, we were always flying somewhere for something. And so Beatrice's first flight was when she was about a week old or two weeks old. And, um, and then every week we were somewhere. So we were on airplanes all the time. And they would always make that announcement um, about the oxygen masks. You know, if the oxygen, there's a shortage, um, the mask will come down. And then they always said, um, you know, if you're traveling with small children, um, put your own oxygen mask on first and then put the mask on the child. And it always made me panicky because I thought, no, no, that's backwards. I have to save Beatrice's life. I can't, you know, who cares whether I'm gasping for breath. And, um, and I, never, I always resisted it. Luckily, it never happened, so it didn't matter. <laughs> but I always thought it was, it was, I literally believed it was totally backwards until, um, 
I was in, in grief counseling after my husband died and, um, and the, the grief counselors, you know, talked about how if I don't work on myself, I can't, I won't have the fortitude and the strength and even the, you know, be able to make room with compassion for, for anyone else. Because I was again in that struggle because of course, Beatrice lost her father, I lost my husband and we were alone. It was just the two of us, you know. Um, and so then I thought of that oxygen mask thing. And I, so I said to the grief counselors, you know, is it sort of like, you know, and I explained the, the uh, metaphor and she said, exactly. She said, you have to, um, you know, if you're not strong, you're, you could only, you know, potentially even cause harm to the other person because if you're, you might drag the other person down in, in, um, inadvertently. So when Gertrude shared that, it reminded me again of how important that is. And, um, and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad that Beatrice is, uh, we, we, I've been sending her all these um, self-care things <laughs> like, like lavender um, bubble bath and, and, and um, a, 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 um, what do you call those things? The, the diffuser, essential oil diffuser, essential yeah. oil diffuser and, um, and a, she loves bread, so I found a pillow that is looks like a huge baguette. It's really big, and I sent that so she could cuddle up with a big loaf of bread. And um, because I was really concerned, I knew she was she was, you know, bravely venturing into a space um, in her desire to heal others. But but I know how much she still carries in herself, and that's why she has so much empathy and compassion. But at the same time, um, you know, if she falls apart right in the midst of trying to heal others, it would be catastrophic for a lot of people, not just even for her. So um, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, you know, the keeping that balance. I will add that the first weekend of the festival retreat, the main weekend that had the most events, I also was in this online show that was taking place on weekends. And so I was, toggling back and forth between Zoom and online show with two devices and all day um, on Saturday and all day on Sunday um, and on Friday also actually. And I did, knowing that I made a lot of plans, a lot of, you know, wrote it all out, made sure I knew exactly where I needed to be and I had everything set up and got up early and had a good breakfast. But I also, um, just like simple self-care stuff, you know, I. I cooked earlier in the week, I cooked a bunch of huge meals and put them all in the fridge. Um, and so, cause I knew I would have maybe five minutes maximum or 10 minutes maximum to eat something quickly between things or during things, you know, when one person is speaking, I could turn off my video and eat a little bit or whatever. Um, and, you know, I made sure I slept, you know, there's, there's things like that where I knew, you know, in needing to hold the space, I had to be functional and, and, you know, nourish myself and rest and, you know, be, be present. So even on the simple level, I agree that, you know, you have to, you have to be yeah ready to go if you're going to be holding space for a lot of people's emotions um, and processes. Um, I keep wondering because it came up in an uh, Zoom talk that people uh, regard the beige if you name sp spiral dynamics, so just eating, resting uh, is uh, unimportant and it's very important. It's very important that you're aware how much you sleep you need and how much sleep you get and what kind of food you eat. So when that is settled, you can build up all your beautiful ideas and all your fantastic visions. But if this doesn't work, uh, yeah. So I do understand that people are rather hesitant risking their health one way or another by negligent others and the awareness of 
how important our health is, is, is this really settled in in these last couple of months. Um, I always took it for granted. I, I just, I had some very, very severe health uh, crisis, but I never, I just went through them and people said, well, you just were lucky and you could have died. And yeah, so what? So I, I'm not worried about anything, but I know I have to take care of myself. And of course, as much as I can, the family around me. But I would, I would uh, really suggest that we consider this part of our development as very important. That's what I just what came to me. Um, yeah, I think along those lines, Monia, uh, this is a time where I get wrapped up in, in things I need to get done and tasks and giving to other people, gifts and all kinds of things. Um, I've got a couple of friends who have family members with very serious, serious illnesses. So, you know, I'm trying to keep in touch with them and be supportive. And the one person I leave out of the equation is always me, you know. Um, so I'm trying to keep space for that. And whether it's, you know, taking the time to meditate or putting on music that I like to listen to, or, you know, just taking a breath and not feeling so caught up and, and leaving some space for myself. That's important. Um, and, you know, you guys uh, in talking about reimagine uh, brought up grief for me um, as, as I imagine a lot of people, you know, miss their loved ones over the holidays. You know, it's a time where I associate um, Christmas with my parents visiting from New Jersey. Uh, they would come out every year and this was the one time that they would spend an extended visit with us. So um, they both have passed and they haven't, the last time they visited was 2006. So it's it's been a while. It's not like it was the other day. It's been a while, but you know, every season there's just things that remind me of them and uh, you know, makes me sad that they're no longer here sharing that. Uh, with my family. But I feel like I'm doing plenty of service to other people. I don't need to do more. My, my work is service to other people. Um, I've got friends that uh, are in need of service. Um, we are redoing our lease in the office. And I'm, I've kind of spearheaded that because nobody seemed to be taking, taking it on. So I'm kind of leading the way for the five of us to coordinate with the landlord and, and it's, it's a big job. Um, so I feel like that's a way of being of service to the people in the office um, and it's plenty. <laughs> I need to be of service to myself uh, in some ways and, and just continue to um, be mindful of that and, and make room. Can I ask you a question? Uh, do you ask for other people to do things for you and to be in service to you? Um, not very much, not enough. Um, partly because it doesn't occur to me. I, I'm very self-sufficient and used to doing things on my own, um, but uh, try to do that more in my marriage because that's important. Um, so I don't, build resentfulness. Uh, so that comes up there sometimes. And I guess in small ways, um, Alexis is living with us and she's our 22 year old. So I will ask her to do things um, to be helpful. And she offers usually, but I will also ask her to do something. Uh, in terms of the office lease, I've kind of just, if I need somebody to do something, I've just kind of stepped back and asked if somebody else will take something on. So I have a little bit there, you know, see if anybody else is willing to step up and do some things because I can't do it all. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, part of it would be not just making room for myself, but actually even the next big step is, is asking uh, for some help, but that's a little bit more awkward. Yeah, and I, I ask because I think 
especially we women who are self-sufficient, have a problem to ask other people to be in, because we can do it perfectly ourselves. And then <laughs> I, I observe that I also feel sort of guilty when I ask somebody to do something which I could quite as well do myself, you know? So I think we have to also to learn something here too. And the fact is that people often are happy to do something for us. No, and they feel like when when they offer and we say no no I do it myself, uh, then they might not feel uh, valued. How do you say uh, recognized in 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 the the generosity? So uh, for me, it's a big learning curve at the moment too. Yeah. Good point. For me, it's also an interesting time. Thank you, Beatrice and Victoria, for bringing up the grief part. <clears throat> um, a week ago, I had a Zoom with my little ones in New Zealand. And the youngest, she's five. She couldn't understand that Granny can't come to her graduation this year. And she was in tears, because she doesn't understand the situation in terms of flights and, and things like that. And it really hit me hard. And then the next day, my landlord, they were packing to go on holiday. And it was such a realization that this year we won't have my mother with us for the first time. <clears throat> and also we not, the whole family can't be together. So it also really hit me on that level. On my own personal journey in the last couple of months, especially the last three, was being deeply involved in an initiative that, that covered six weeks. And what I discovered is I must just be present to serve others. I don't have to do this doing stuff that I'm so used to and leading stuff. I just need to be present and feel in my body what others are experiencing, that I can mirror it back to them, that they can experience the physicality of whatever they are experiencing. And it was such a beautiful space to be in because I literally don't need to give energy away. I just need to hold it. And then on my own to look after myself was swimming daily was really helping me to just move through the water, to stay in flow and not get stuck because I'm so energetic. I continuously, that, that's why the doing part comes so easily. But the swimming part is just slowing me down also, and um, especially now in our spring and summer, to then stay in flow, but also to bring balance in my own life. And what I discovered on my own personal journey in serving others through many, many different initiatives this year was not to identify with their experiences, that I'm serving them when I'm able to just stay present and not judge it, not having any opinion, whatever they talk about, whatever they're going through. But that's more valuable than me saying anything. So it's a continuous process. And I just feel that I become more powerful in myself too when I do that. That I have more to share and to offer when I don't go into that space of sharing an opinion or taking on other people's stuff, or um, because then I go out of my body. So being present in my body is very important. And when I do feel that I'm going off balance, I stop immediately in whatever I was busy with, so that I don't put that energy into whatever I'm sharing. And it's been fascinating because I've built, been building up a lot of energy through it that I can now put into a beautiful initiative that we are launching in January, the next level of organization of people who are interested in exploring what would that be or how we organize ourselves in a time like this, especially hearing stories from people who work in corporates and other bigger organizations of, like one of you mentioned it as well, there's, there's no break anymore. Like previously you would have gotten into your car and go work. People who didn't work from home. Now you're working 16 hours a day, constantly in front of Zoom without any breaks. So it's a completely um, overwhelming burnout experience because there's no, there's no boundaries anymore between 
a healthy experience of our own inner life and now with our families and loved ones and friends, it's all now one mushy thing. And that's what excites me is that we can be of service to others to help them to create co-create a blueprint of how can we move forward from an organizational point of view and sharing that with organizations and leaders and um, people who work in such environments. And which is also prevalent to all of us who work by ourselves and from home. So that has become very clear for me and that I just need to stay present and to really feel and share what I'm feeling and not be afraid of sharing that. I'm complete. Yeah, that was very powerful, Hanali. I think that's such an important observation about boundaries. And it reminded me of um, many, many years ago when people were just starting to use cell phones. Um, I happened to get a ride from a music festival back to my town that was up in the mountains and um, with a, someone I didn't know at all. It was a um, Korean businessman. And um, he was proudly telling me that because he had a cell phone, now he could work 24 seven. And he was so happy about it. And I said, well, that's insane. You know, how do you, someone, you might be going to the bathroom or sleeping or in the middle of dinner and the, your phone will ring and how, you know, how does that work? And, and he said, well, just imagine, he said, I'm making like 10 times as much money as my um, competitors because I'm always available. And I never miss a beat. You know, I, I, every time there's a possibility to make a sale, I'm there, you know. And he was just delighted. And I remember just like feeling my stomach churn. And I thought, as long as I live on the planet, I will never have a cell phone. <laughs> I mean, not that I would anyway, anyone would be calling me, but, um, but I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about boundaries because that's sort of something we've talked about more in the last few years in our society. But I think what you said, Hanley, is really, I mean, I haven't thought about that story for decades, but I think it's really, um, we're in another situation like that where we make our, we open ourselves up to um, sort of complete, like a tsunami of possibilities of, of what can take our time and attention and our emotions. And if we don't protect ourselves, um, we can just be completely overwhelmed. So thank you for that. That's, I think that's really profound. Yeah, and I think not to go away to work, we don't have the separation anymore, no? Uh, because then work is the whole day, more or less. And then you, are, you don't know what is work now exactly. Is now cooking also work or is it only when I read a book or is it only when I, you know, do a course or what is work and what is free time? And I think we don't really get it. I, I consider when we are together, that's work or no, it's also nice, but you know, at the other hand, it's what I'm doing uh, to, to organize uh, groups and to uh, and interviews. So probably it's my work. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really know. So we are almost at the top of the hour, but Christine, go ahead, because I wanted to suggest to do. Uh, I was go just going to say, I would probably distinguish it if it feel if, if it's a responsibility it's work. <laughs> if it's a, just a total free choice, then it, it then it's fun or pleasure. But responsibility, even if it's, you know, cooking dinner for your family, there's a responsibility to that, even if you enjoy it somewhat. So I have a lot of work. I go to the vegetable garden and today I planted something and then in the summer you have to water it. Then I have a cat who has always problems and I have to give her medications and treatments. Then it's work too. And I feel responsibility to hold these groups. Then it's work too. Uh, okay, then it's when I listen to music in the evening. Then it's not work. <laughs> they are wonderful, by the way, Arte. Arte concert, uh, who is in, 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 in our part of the world, they have wonderful concerts and the Berlin Philharmonics, they play uh, with empty uh, auditorium, but wonderful music. So that's what I, my, my evenings, evenings look like after all the work. So now I oh, want no, to- I, Sorry, I know we're getting out of time, but I just, 
I don't know about that distinction between work and free time because I, I mean, I agree that maybe that's how you can define how the responsibility thing that makes sense. But I, but I also feel like, you know, in my, in my mind, the goal is to find work that also nourishes and fulfills you and is something that you feel called and driven to do and is, is something that, you know, that's really coming from here. And at that point, I mean, yes, it's still work because it requires you to show up in a certain way and do certain things. But I, then I think it doesn't, I don't know. And I'm, I'm not being very articulate, but I think, I think what I'm thinking about is the distinction between the work and free time um, in a society where usually the work is something that you don't want to do, where there's like a negative connotation to work. And then the free time is like, this is where I get to be me, you know? Um, and how can we destroy that and actually have all the things that we do in life be things that we care about, even if sometimes they're hard things or unpleasant or responsibilities, but how can it be fulfilling and still generating in a way that is positive? And anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. Well, I, I completely uh, agree with you, Patrish, and uh, maybe it's just your life what you are living. It's not your work and your free time. Uh, when I, well, it's because I'm very old now, but when I, today, when I prepared uh, lunch, uh, cutting, it's a meditation. So that's not work. It's, it's uh, an enjoyment, how a sharp knife and the vegetables that you cut it, or I watched a, a, a clip of, uh, of your oil, I stumbled across it on YouTube, Heidi, uh, when this oil uh, was just poured. It's, well, of course it's work, but it's just, it's beautiful, the way it flows. And so even when I have to do the laundry and hang it up, it's not work. It's just a hanging up meditation. <laughs> So um, uh, I don't differentiate anymore, but of course I'm lucky. I don't have to go to an office or to do the homework. So that's really home office. It's rather challenging when you do, home. I see it in my daughter, my second daughter. It's challenging to set boundaries for yourself because you just could go on all, as, you, as Victoria said, with the cell phone. And that's about the worst exploitation of yourself. So it's really, but that was my final statement of what tonight. <laughs> I, I just, oh, I, I just wanted to tell you something. We have a Zoom meeting now of a peer group and I did the exercise, Gertrude did with us, uh, the appreciation exercise. And it changed the whole atmosphere and all of a sudden you could feel your heart. And so it's, I wanted to thank you again, Gertrude. It's a really, I appreciate that you shared it with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great tool. Thank you. I just wanted to share two, two spiritual um, uh, sort of examples of, of this whole discourse that, that I try to hold in my mind or heart. Um, one is the, I, I'm, I'm very close to a Benedictine monastery and the, the motto of St. Benedict who founded um, monasticism as we know it was ora et labora, um, prayer and work. And, but the, um, and of course the day of the monks is divided uh, between the daily office, the prayer services, which are essentially every three hours. And in between they do work, whether it's gardening or office work or cooking or cleaning or whatever they have to do to maintain the monastery. And, um, but the abbot said to me once we were talking about it and he said, you know, St. Benedict actually said, even though ora et labora is, is the motto, um, St. Benedict himself said that you must, um, you know, prayer needs to be worked too. And he didn't mean that, that it's um, laborious <laughs> to pray, um, even though it can be, of course, people have their dry spells. 
but it's the idea that it's it's all one it's the same so um so if your attitude towards work is that work is something you know what well, we use the word laborious in english to kind of be something that that is hard to do and wears us out and isn't very um fulfilling but it's more the idea that there's that that they're intermingled that while you're working you're praying and while you're praying you're working and it's all it's all one life that's organically connected and then um the other is from um when i was in nepal visiting my grandmother um i couldn't i was sick with encephalitis and i couldn't leave i had to stay in a dark room for for a month and a half um, when I was recovering. And so I thought, well, here I am in, in Nepal, I'm gonna read the Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita was this beautiful um, statement that said, let everything you do be a sacrament. So it doesn't matter, like, like Monia said, if you're chopping vegetables or hanging up the laundry. My mother, I said her favorite thing in life was hanging up the laundry because she said, that's when I really can think. <laughs> and um, so I think that that's the thing to strive for from a spiritual perspective. I think that 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 there there is ultimately no differentiation because at every moment, or Saint Paul said, "Pray without ceasing," which essentially means not that you're actually like doing formal prayers, but everything you do is an act, a sacrament. Um, anyway, sorry I talked so long, but I just I think that's a, such a beautiful thing to strive for. I mean, I don't do it myself, but I wish I could. <laughs> it's something to strive for. I was just thinking uh, in closing that um, something like you're all right. <laughs> um, and what Monia said about the appreciation, it's if you don't have like, uh, what do you call it? So uh, like completion of something you did before, if you don't celebrate and appreciate what you have done, then it's just one hamster wheel, one thing. And if you have sections where you say like, if you, in a poem, you have this section and then the next one or in a music piece or in the Bible or what. So like complete sections and, and celebrate them and have a break in between, like the breath uh, in and out. And so, so it's more like, is it giving me energy or is it draining? Do I, do I have pauses where I celebrate what has been done or appreciate or whatever you call it? Um, so I find people that that go on working like, you know, like like this, this hamster meal, uh, mill and then you, you say, okay, what can we can we just wrap up and complete this? And then I said, yeah, but I have to go for the next and go back. What you can you acknowledge yourself for? And and when you have those breaks, then it makes a difference for for people. And of course, the physical part cannot be neglected. Uh, neglected. You cannot sleep two hours a night, and that's it. And then stay healthy over time so so there's some physical <laughs> boundaries to to what we can do so i i think yeah if if it's so i wouldn't say work or not so that doesn't mean much to me because i'm i'm self-employed and uh, but if it gives me energy i can go on <laughs> if it doesn't i'm exhausted after a few hours yeah. My mother had hamsters as pets as a child, and I just thought of that. And <laughs> I don't know, people sometimes pick pets that represent them. You know how sometimes some people look like their dog or they look like their cat or, you know, there's that resemblance. Oh, well, my mother chose hamsters, and I think that says a lot. 
<laughs> Sorry, I love you. I just couldn't help but share that. By the way, we have turtles. And uh, one of them really was the model for ET, I swear. <laughs> just telescope wise with a head out, very like curious and um, looks exactly like ET. So <laughs> what does that say about us? <laughs> How long do they hibernate, the turtles? I didn't know that they did. We have one of the, the, you know, it's not the, from the sea, but uh, in between. So they need water. The two, I don't know which one is tortoise and the other one is turtle, but we have Greek land turtle. turtle. Mm -hmm. And how long do they have it? It depends on the, they are like go with the temperature. So now they are ready to put them on the attic and, so below eight degrees, they they hibernate, and so there are some winters we we don't even bother because it's too mm -hmm. too hot, too mm -hmm. warm. So some more last words. I just wanted to say, Heidi, now I know why you call this the wisdom factory, because uh, so much wisdom, and I think from, from everybody and from different perspectives, it was really, um, now I feel like all I have to do is absorb everything that was said today and my life will be fabulous. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. And I thank everyone, because in the factory, there are normally people who work together, no? And you are helping to, to create the wisdom. No? It is, needs to be composed. It needs to be, how do you say, sourced in some way. So that was the idea when we took the name Wisdom Factory, that there is no wisdom just there, but it has to be elaborated in some way. That would already be my, my check out. <laughs> And I would like to know what the summer girl is saying. <laughs> check out. The, um, Greta, I also want to thank you for the appreciation that you brought into this space. <clears throat> During the six weeks experience, we had a closure, closing ceremony, and I brought that part in as well. And it was so beautifully accepted and people are still doing it. So. They just we created a, a Google a Google form where people could share with individuals what they appreciated about them participating in the six weeks journey. But then after that closing experience, they continue doing it. So it created also a sense of connection between people beyond the experience and um, some continuity. So it was most beautiful. And now she was speaking about pets. I was wondering about, we always had dogs. And my daughter has cats and I love both of them. My children, my son also had hamsters and he's also a very busy body. And he would take a remote control car and he would break it open and put the hamster inside and then up and down in the hallway the poor, the poor creature in this thing. <laughs> so you make me think of him because he's just like my dad used to be as well. Um, so there is some truth in that. I need to tell him about it, uh, that he must also slow down. Maybe he must go the turtle and the tortoise route for a while just to slow down his life. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Heidi, for this beautiful space. Christine, I, I think you haven't shared yet or you didn't close yet, but I have a suggestion for next next time. So <laughs> I want to wait. Um, I just enjoyed today. And uh, as Victoria said, we'll take a lot of things with me uh, about what people mentioned. And uh, we'll try to remember to ask more for people to give and and to be able to receive from people.
I have a suggestion for next time to uh, complete and appreciate the last year. So to, to really have a closing session for this and then start in, I don't know, what is it, 20... 21st and the next one would be the fourth if we want to so but 21st would be a good enough time for <laughs> until christmas and so and i could do that i mean i could think about the questions we could ask ourselves so that's wonderful so looking forward to that and have a good time i'm wondering my cat is very impatient and uh, Jimmy Schiefmaul, who knows German, knows what it is. He has a mouth like this. <laughs> I don't think I have it yet. So, <laughs> so Yerity is not so big yet. Maybe with the other old cat, she's always sleeping. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to next time and have a good evening or day. It's so light in California. No, here it's all dark. <laughs> And I appreciate that you are joining the scope and it's always nice. It feels like home. Thank you. Mm. Leave the room. Wie kann ich das denn jetzt abschalten? Du klickst auf das Rote und dann kommt auf uh, Shut the Meeting for All oder sowas. Ja, und dann macht es automatisch. Genau, da sind wir alle beide weg. Und dann ist die... Okay. Okay. Mhm. Ciao, ciao. Bis meine Liebe. Ciao. Meeting für alle beenden. Genau.